this is the Loco Foco Netcast. I'm Timothy Verkula. You can find me at, at Workman on social media, at workman.com, and at locofoco.net, where this podcast is hosted. And this episode is, you can tell, maybe by the muffle in my voice, and maybe by the mask on my face if you're watching. This is the coronavirus episode. But I don't really need the mask to do the show. So, oh, before I go too far, I should mention that the Locofoco Netcast is available on SoundCloud, iTunes, and Spotify, as well as video on YouTube. And today we're joined by Emil from New Zealand to talk about the coronavirus. So, Emil, your last name, how do we pronounce that? Faneff. Faneff. Something like that. Uh, it's odd. I don't speak French. Faneff. Okay, very good. And uh, I'm sporting a coronavirus haircut that I haven't had one in several months. You uh, have another, uh, I, think, I guess it's like a coronavirus haircut. <laughs> <laughs> haircut. Uh, I just I just saw an article uh, in this great day of the quarantine that our kinds of beards are probably okay for the, with the masks. Oh really? Our yeah. kinds of beards? Along, yeah, a, a, tri- a short short trimmed, uh, and it, it shouldn't be too much of a problem. But longer beards and long mustaches and and really bushy ones are, they say, are breeding grounds for coronavirus. I can imagine. I have yeah. no idea if it's true. It's sort of intuitively obvious, but we don't have a background to. Right, I certainly don't. And <laughs> I would have thought that bacteria might grow in beards. I wouldn't have thought viruses would be especially uh, receptive to. I don't even understand how that works. So that's 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 where we're at. It's a good place to make cottage cheese, I think. Anyway, you've been doing some research. Uh, sure, I have. So I've been doing. Uh, I've been trying to figure out in terms of, uh, in terms of, uh, if we are going to come up with policies. What would be the most the most effective policies to both control the spread of the virus and minimize the mortality rate without pursuing, let's say, draconian measures? You know, following people around with drones, uh, putting uh, putting pictures of people that are infected all over the city so everyone can know and avoid them. That kind of thing that's sort of being done in China at the moment. And I've been told uh, that the drone following a Spanish friend of mine told me that they're doing the same in Spain. Uh, and by the way, at least the ones in, in, uh, in China, they have loudspeakers. So they, the drones follow people around in the streets who don't have masks and, and sort of yell at them, go back to your home, go back to your home. Um, yeah, I, I think most people don't want to live that way. <laughs> okay, yeah, I think I could say that's true. Though I, I, I brought my mask uh, to uh, the supermarket today. I didn't wear it, but I had it around so I could if I felt like I needed, but no one else was wearing a mask. Yeah, no mm. I, I who, where was I looking at? I, I was looking on a New Zealand government website, and they were saying that they, unless you have uh, some respiratory, uh, uh, some ill, some illness, you're elderly or something, the the New Zealand government isn't advising that people wear masks. But uh, I understood the masks is largely to prevent the spread of the disease from the person who's a host, and then if you don't, if you haven't tested, you don't know if you're a host or not. That's what I understood. That, that's uh, what I think that I understand as well. It also said something like, like if you cough while you're in the mask, it, of course, minimizes the, the distance of the spread and all that. Uh, so, yes, that's also my I, – I could be wrong, but that's also what I, I'm thinking I'm supposed to understand. <laughs> yeah, now, my perspective is, is what would happen if we lived in a really free society where the government didn't even have the power to do the things that, you know, that they're doing, doing right now in various states of the union and around the world even worse. And uh, I would just think that uh, people would have a custom that if you're sick, normally you would go out with a mask as they do in German, uh, in Japan. And then when they're given a warning that there's a epidemic going around, then they would just do it normally. That's right. And I, I can confirm uh, what you said because uh, I, I, I have lived in Japan for a couple of years, uh, long before coronavirus in the early 2000s. And uh, when someone would have just a common cold, they would be uh, volunteering to wear the mask and just as just a part of a uh, common courtesy to everyone else. Uh, so it was voluntary and it, it worked. And it was, it was the only, uh, 
it was only the uh, gaijin, which is uh, the Japanese word for foreigners. It was only the gaijins that, that really weren't uh, being so considerate. <laughs> yeah, well, you kind of have to have a culture to get it to work like that, right? That's one of the things is that you, and that's, and that's one of the things about culture in a free society is that it probably would step up to the plate. But in a society that's run by a big government where everybody expects the government to save us in times of crisis, these kind of things don't necessarily uh, evolve. That's right. I, I think, yeah, if we're going to talk about policy, perhaps this is, uh, this precedes policy because this begins with uh, sort of uh, uh, what kind of culture would we need to have so that we could live in a free society to begin with, right? So if we step back and put all policy aside, I, I think a free society re requires that citizens are, are, are uh, responsible. They take responsibility for their actions and so on. So, and one way in which people would minimize the spread of diseases in the absence of a, of a state or even a minimal state would, would certainly be, let's say, for example, wearing face masks, masks and um, social distancing all by themselves. Now, given that we, of course, have nation states, I certainly don't mind that, that nation states and their health ministries and so on remind people that, hey, social distancing is, a, is actually a, a good idea, especially if you have these symptoms. Yeah, now I went to the market today and I didn't wear my mask exactly, but I did have I did have on my uh, gloves the whole time. Yeah, that, that's interesting because most of the spread, well, I don't know about most of the spread, but I know uh, they keep reminding people of which surfaces tend to hold the virus and it, it tends to be between one and three, three days depending on the surface. And I know this is true for cardboard, I know it's true for plastics, and I knew, know it's true for metals. Uh, and, and the maximum tends to be three days, but it tends to be like 40 out, 48 hours, depending on the, the surface, which seems odd to me. Like, why aren't they requiring people or why aren't they encouraging people uh, instead of wearing face masks, at least equally, if not, if it's going to be one or the other, I don't know why it wouldn't be the, 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 the hand gloves. Right. Instead. And I did it actually largely for myself because frankly, I have a difficulty not rubbing my eyes. I just do yeah. it. I, I, I just do it all the time. Yeah. So I, I started wearing them basically today. I just discovered last night that, you know, I have a huge supply of, of latex and nitrile exam gloves. I just have like four or five boxes of these things. I thought, why not use them? So, yeah, I mean, if you ever wear them, why wouldn't it be in the Corona economy? <laughs> exactly. Exactly. And by the way, there was plenty of toilet paper in the store that I was in today. So I was, I was heartened. Ah, well, we, we who sort of understand uh, uh, price theory, uh, we, we understand the importance of uh, allowing the pro sort of price gouging. And in response, you want manufacturers increasing output, pursuing those profit opportunities because you, you you know you you want uh, you don't you don't want scarce toilet paper. You want lots of people to have it. And, and of course, once they increase output and, and they're sort of catching up, then it pushes the prices right back down. So. But getting that across to people is not necessarily <laughs> the easiest thing because you can explain no. it to them and they can still say you're immoral to even suggest that somebody raise the prices on, on you know, this infectant while, they're, while the coronavirus scare is going on. That's right. They want Soviet style rationing and, and somehow think that it wouldn't end up in a Soviet style uh, shortages. Uh, it, right. <laughs> and worse. I mean, Soviet style is a word for not just shortages. <laughs> mm, that's right. Like your drones, like your drones. That, that's, that seems awfully intrusive to me. I know. I know. I know. I agree. What have you learned about timeline of infection? And, you know, people are talking about various curves that we have to negotiate the early part of the period. And so that's why they're suggesting, you know, a strict, strict, rigorous... Uh, adherence to whatever the rules they're setting up for us for the for the first few weeks, I guess, and then I guess they believe we can lax off. Is that the idea? Uh, so you might be following the the, the curves a little closer than I am. I, I generally understand it. Uh, in, with social distancing and sort of preventive measures, we can sort of I think call flatten the curve. So instead of having the infection rate like this, it's something closer like this. I noticed that people in the well, I'm, I'm certainly not going to speak for all of them. I'm, I'm sure there's all kinds of more reasonable uh, health professionals. But I, I noticed that when I see the health professionals, let's say representative of, of the World Health Organization and so on, I noticed that when they speak, they, they only talk about in terms of uh, minimizing the spread and, of course, decreasing the mortality rate. And, and this is perfectly reasonable. This is part of the equation. 
on the other side, you have people have, who have sort of economic thinking and, and they, and these people, um, if to the extent that I have economic thinking, it's certainly how I think. Uh, the other part of the trade-off is how is it that we can possibly feed, I think it's 7.6 billion people on the planet without a global division of labor, which means that people have to be going to work. How, how are you going, the only way in which we can sustain our current, our current uh, levels of, uh, let's say, being alive in the population <laughs> is, is by people going to work, right? So you, 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 can, do, you can do these outright bans for, let's say, a minimal time, but you certainly can't sustain them for the, for the long term. And, and what I fear is that, is that, the more that the more that each nation state within its respective borders, it starts knowing, noticing more cases, it's going to become increasingly more a draconian and saying, okay, nobody can go to work. Not only have we sh shut the schools down long ago, but people also can't go to work. Great. Right. Of course, that means uh, increased scarcity on the, on the shelves, uh, higher prices. Uh, people can't pay their mortgages, can't pay their rent and so on. And landlords aren't getting it. And so it's, it, it's, it's planned chaos. To coin a phrase. <laughs> yes. Well, have you read the, have you read the Mises uh, essay on that, well, uh, the title? No, no, I, I, I actually haven't, but I, I know it, I know of it very well. And I know a lot of people uh, uh, sort of um, said what, I mean, cause a lot of the, the, the policy proposals in, in terms of how we respond to, to COVID-19, uh, they, they resemble things that, that Venezuela has been doing over the past few years, uh, you know, price controls and, and, you know, uh, endless spending and, uh, and, and you, you have shortages and, and the government, the government, instead of, uh, recognizing some fault to, for the, for the, for, for the problems that are, that have been happening, uh, they, they, they merely just demonize people who raise prices. They demonize people who, who just sort of, well, hoard, right? That's the bad word hoarding, right? But when people see, when people think that the government might ban X or that people, that government would keep prices at some given level for the, for, for manufacturers and the manufacturers won't be able to increase output because they won't be able to make a, a, a profit up. They won't be able to make a profit on the, on the production of their goods and sale. People quite literally, or quite rationally, I think, respond to that by, well, stocking their own shelves, right? Uh, but demonizing people who stock their shelves is, is not the way to go about it uh, at all. In this context, I'm kind of annoyed that generally people don't have a supply. I, I think everybody should have a month's supply of food in their house. I mean, to me, that seems actually too little. And yeah. so I'm, yeah. <laughs> and so now, and, and when you encounter somebody on Twitter, who actually rails against anyone who has more than two weeks of uh, supply of food and said they should be fined heavily if they have a two, more than I've seen this. It's just astounding. Yeah. That's, that's what we saw in Venezuela. Yeah. And that, that's not a, a big, huge recommendation. So the world health organization, it tends to be my primary source. It's a little faulty because the world health organization updates its data about its database uh, as the nation states around the world update the, the, the World Health Organization with their data, right? So I certainly, no, so I noticed that, uh, for example, uh, what the, uh, cent the U.S. Center for Disease Control, I noticed that its numbers uh, were slightly higher than what the, the WHO had, had on, on its numbers for the United States. It's also a little bit difficult because if you want to look at Taiwan or Hong Kong or Macau, you can't find them in the WHO's numbers. Uh, so I think they're just jumbling into mainland China's numbers. Um, there's a geopolitical issue there, of course. It also has the numbers of death per country, which uh, I, I, I think are a little, little problematic, to say the least, because uh, you might find someone that's dead that does indeed uh, have the coronavirus in their, in their system, but they might not have died from the coronavirus, right? right. Uh, so so I, I think to a certain extent, uh, the death rates might be I'm not an expert here, but but I think it's plausible that the that the death that the the, the numbers of deaths uh, reported for each country uh, might be higher than what they actually are. Also, it's important to mention uh, that the uh, it for each country it has confirmed cases, but a confirmed case is, is only that. Uh, so uh, that that means that means that that uh, they've found X amount of people that they believe uh, indeed have the virus, but it's, it's reasonable to assume that there are a number of people that they don't know about who are also walking around infecting other people that do have the virus. 
there, there's also the possibility that the, uh, let's say the, the little devices they're using to, to see if people have the, that, that they're reporting false positives, right? So thinking someone has the coronavirus when they don't, but, but my, my guess is that there are more people walking around that do have the virus than, uh, than there are, uh, let's say, overinflated num numbers of confirmed cases uh, reporting false positives. Uh, okay. All right. So, so that's, uh, so, but we have to begin with a data set and the WHO has, has one. It's right. the best, let's say, centralized data set you can go to and play with the numbers, right? So, uh, you know, the worst case is, of course, China uh, in terms of numbers of reported cases. Uh, it's over 80,000. I don't remember the exact number. And my numbers are as of Friday. Uh, what was Friday? Two days ago. Uh, the 20th. Okay, the 20th. So to the 20th of uh, March. March 2020. For people that are watching online, that's 20th of March 2020. Uh, the WHO is, re is probably like 24 hours behind the nation states of every country. So, But, but it was over 80,000. Uh, they don't report the death rates. They just report the, uh, the numbers of deaths of people that had coronavirus and report them as a coronavirus virus uh caused death a COVID 19 reported death uh so i had to sort of just copy and paste them into an excel spreadsheet to to look at the death rates i noticed that china had i think it was about four something percent death rate the highest in the world was italy uh with over eight percent now that's 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 really that's really tough i mean imagine eight percent eight percent of people that get it die if we're to sort of sort of take the numbers at face value an italian friend of mine the other day i was speaking with him over the phone uh, or whatsapp um and uh and he mentioned that in italy you can't just show up at a, at a at a clinic and say hey i'd like to get tested i fear that i might have it or i live in an area here in the north of italy where there are a lot of cases i'd like to get tested please uh you actually can't do that I, i'm told it's uh they're resorting to uh curfews um, you, you complete lockdowns, um, this kind of thing. Right. Uh, but you, you can't, you can't get tested whenever you want. Another country who, who had, who had a, a huge number of cases in the beginning, I'm actually forgetting the number of cases, uh, but it was South Korea. It's up there in terms of numbers of top numbers of reported of confirmed cases. And in South Korea, they approach it a very different way and they're, they're getting a lot of praise around the world. And their death rate is about 1%. I think it might have been slightly below 1%. And the way in which they're approaching it is they put um, uh, drive-through testing centers all over the country. I think it was over 40, maybe 50. Uh, and it's a, it's a small country uh, about the size of Arkansas, right? So, but, but 50 around a country the size of Arkansas, 40, 50. And it's completely voluntary. You can just show up. You don't have to leave your car. And a medical professional comes to you. They uh, they'll they'll put something in your mouth, maybe getting saliva. They'll they'll yeah. stick something up your nose and test you this kind of way. We had a big spike in Italy in terms of numbers of cases, and a really high death rate. People don't have the way uh, a way to go and get themselves tested, even if they're only they're just suspicious, or or even if they're not suspicious that they have it, they just want to get tested. Uh, in South Korea, they're able to just pull up to a drive-through. They don't even have to get out of their car. And it's free. Of course, I, uh, my guess is that it's highly subsidized by the government. But it is what it is. Uh, I mean, libertarians can say, oh, well, you know, that's a profit opportunity. You could have private firms going and doing that. And actually, I agree. That is, if you, if you let them, it's actually a good solution. But uh, if you are going to have socialized medical care, and if you're trying to control the, 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 spread of, uh, the spread of disease, certainly this seems to me to be a much better way to attack the problem than, than what Italy's doing. So there's the voluntary drive-throughs, but then there's also, there was a church or two churches that uh, they're, they're big religious events where people think, ah, oh, don't listen to that. Come over to your services. And apparently a lot of people are getting, uh, are getting infected by going to large religious events in, in South Korea. But the government's response to that isn't a volunteer. It, they don't just invite people. Hey, come get tested, please. Uh, in that case, they go and say, all right, you're all getting tested. And that's where, that's where they found sort of the epicenter of Korea's, mass spread of the problem but but it worked so large groups is a is a real contagion problem yeah it is yeah it is and we've kind of known that from other flus too i mean this is not really new news is it i'm certainly not an expert but it, it's certainly plausible that when you're closer to people than than further away from them you're more likely to get what they have <laughs> 
Right, and that's that's one of the reasonable things about uh, closing, especially public schools, is that you yeah. know kids they share a lot of things, including yeah. diseases. Yeah, I, I've been thinking how how can we possibly uh, sort of in a free society, whether it be public or private schools, how can we allow our allow our kids to go to schools, uh, not have to shut them down. Um, uh, in one way in which I can think of is why don't you test every kid as they come into school every day or every other day or something like that. Uh, the schools are important because there are a lot of parents that work and they're able to maintain a livelihood only because they're expecting their kids to be able to spend what, I don't know, 30, 40 hours a week at a place. Right. Uh, and, and baby care tends to be a lot higher than, uh, than do schools, especially if you're going to a public school, ignoring of course the taxes, uh, uh but, uh, I expect that in places, in countries where they shut down the schools, or even in states and cities and so on, you're going to have a, a lot higher unemployment because people are going to have to quit their jobs, at least some people. Uh, and that's, that's not helpful either. Which is why I keep on coming back to uh, self-protection. Basically just making each person sort of responsible for their contagions and uh, expect, expecting people who are, are sick or could be sick to, in some ways, prevent the spread. So that's like gloves and, and a mask. Though, you know, I was thinking today as I was putting on this really goofy mask I have, wouldn't a handkerchief work as well? I suspect it would help. but uh, It would be better than no handkerchief is what I'm suggesting. I uh, assume so. I assume it would, as, if you sneeze, I imagine it would minimize. And in fact, that's exactly what, what they're asking people to do in their elbows. So have you found something that was startling to you in your research? Yeah. Yeah. Well, a lot of them don't require much research. They just re require that you pay attention to, let's say, uh, the news, particularly international news. Uh, one thing I find startling is, you know, Australia and New Zealand, as well as I think um, uh, Argenti Argentina, uh, Chile, um, some other countries, they've shut down their borders to international travelers. In, in New Zealand and Australia, they've shut down incoming air travel, and probably also by, by sea, uh, for, yes, also for, by sea, at least in New Zealand, for people that don't hold a New Zealand passport or permanent uh, residencies, right? So, you know, New Zealand depends a, a great deal upon uh, tourism. Uh, so there's, there's that. Yeah, where do the yeah. hobbits go? Yeah. Yeah, sometimes I call New Zealand, I call it a hobbit down under, yeah. I understand that in January, Russia closed its border with China. So they were pretty fast on that regard. Mm. 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 Um, a friend of mine in Denmark, he posted a blog post. He knows more about this case than I do, I assume, uh, being from there. But uh, um, I haven't fact-checked this, but his logic certainly seemed plausible. Denmark, apparently, they have a, a fairly high number of cases uh, and they, they closed their borders to their, their neighboring countries, uh, I guess by car and by train. Uh, and, and he made the point, I thought it was a plausible one, a, a reasonable one. He, he said, it doesn't make sense for uh, Denmark to close its borders to the bordering nation states, uh, particularly because the bordering nation states have a much lower number of cases in each of their countries, right? So if you're going to make an argument for closed borders based on this, it should be Denmark's neighboring countries Put, closing the borders to the Danish population. That makes sense. Have you been following the United States? Are various states' responses to all this? No, not really. Not really. I, I did go to the Center for Disease Control's website, and they've got a nice map. Uh, but I haven't broken it down state by state and seeing. I did see that one state, they did a, they, they did a South Korean-style drive-through testing, and I thought, ah, oh, good, 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 good. That's much better than mixing it with you know sort of draconian measures um i don't i don't remember which state that was but I, I think that's more reasonable yeah now i'm somewhat dubious about the the scare the scare seems overblown and it seems like we should be getting more advice than hysteria do you have this feeling or do you think that we should be actually very 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 concerned and uh, the media is doing fine well uh i i think the scare is important because it's a real thing uh that's that's what is happening actually is scary so to that extent i actually i think it's reasonable but what i i'm more concerned about frankly 
and I realize I, I have the advantage of being able, being able to think this way because I'm not elderly. I'm not at the, the higher risk age, right? But especially because I'm at the age I am, what certainly what I fear is livelihood. You know, uh, there's a lot of people that, again, we have a, being able to maintain more than 7 billion people on planet Earth depends quite literally on a global division of labor. And what, what is scaring the, uh, the hell out of me is the nation states of the world, how quickly they're moving to stop people from working, basically. Right. right. It's, 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 an, it's an astounding thing. And uh, yeah, I'm just kind of dubious about the whole uh, recovery process. I just don't know how it's going to go. You know, in 1921 in America, we, there was a 1920-21 depression, and it lasted about a year. And the recovery was fast and swift. It, was, it, it, it worked really well. Though my ancestors lost their fortunes during it. That's 21. Actually, 21. 21. Of course, 21. The Great Depression. 20, uh, uh, 30, uh, yeah, 39. 29. 29, 29 to basically the world, through World War II. Worse to, yeah, then, but it lasted about 10 years, yeah. So 21, quick recovery. What did quick they do then? Well, they didn't do much. Uh, in fact, what, what, Woodrow, uh, what uh, not Woodrow Wilson, Woodrow Wilson was kind of almost in a coma. Uh, he was an invalid at the moment, and then he transferred power to Warren Gamaliel Harding. And Harding uh, basically, basically built down the government and got rid of most of the regulations that were there for World War I. So he basically freed up the system completely, and the response was quick. And after World War II, it, the Great Depression lingered for a long time with lots of programs. But after World War II, after the people came home, it was largely a free market. And the recovery time there was not bad. It was pretty good. After World was, War II? Soldiers were coming home, and they, they got to work pretty quickly. And I've always thought that part of the reason for that and the speedy recovery after World War II was the sense of freedom after being – in servitude fighting a war. So people felt liberated and they acted like liberated people. So will we now feel liberated if we are lit up on? My guess is no. My guess is we'll have something what uh, the economist Robert Higgs calls the ratchet effect, which you might be very uh, familiar with his, his book, uh, Crisis and Leviathan, uh, which is it, you after emergencies, you, you have a big government response. And after the emergency has, the crisis has passed, people have already become accustomed to the, the more intrusive way of life. Just like after 9-11, everybody is already used to being sort of felt up by, the, by your local TSA guy uh, at the airport, and, and people certainly don't like it, but many of them, you know, especially younger people, don't know, uh, don't lo don't know life without being felt up at the airport, right? Uh, and, and now you've just... And now you've got all kinds of programs that mostly exist as a jobs program. They do do some function. For example, TSA does find certain things that people shouldn't be bringing on airplanes, in, even in a completely free society. Uh, but net net, we do just live in a more intrusive world. Just like we have the military industrial complex, what I'm seeing from this is my my guess is long after COVID nineteen is is uh, we have good responses and we've, we've got vaccinations yearly like you do the flu kind of thing my guess is long after you'll have what what i've been thinking might be best called something like a medical industrial complex um it just just uh huge companies that just wait around for the next just like j i remember the fbi's new slogan right after uh right after 9 11 was uh something like preventing the next what are they preventing the next 9 11 or something like that uh, and and uh, so they were they were already assuming the next one would be would come uh, or the next terrorist attack on, on the United States or something like that. They had already determined that it's a good justification to keep power for a long time. Yeah, I'm afraid that you're probably right about that. Uh, there was a good novel written in 1996 by Bruce Sterling that actually used the phrase medical industrial complex. Oh, really? Yes. <laughs> because I did come to that independently, and I thought, oh, I, I hope people will use it, but uh, okay. <laughs> well, he was a science fiction writer, and he's supposed to be ahead of the rest of us, right? Um, and uh, he, yeah. th it's actually a, a worthwhile book. There's an element of, it's a really good book. In fact, it's the only one of his I've really enjoyed. And uh, I mean, it's not a perfect novel by any means, but it's still, a, it's an interesting story. And, uh, and it, depicts a world that's highly stratified by the people's acceptance and cooperation with the medical industrial complex. So if you do all the things they tell you, you can get medical treatment. But if you, yeah. for instance, smoke or drink or take weird drugs 
you aren't going to get medical treatment. And so they're very discriminatory. And uh, it's the story of a woman who gets one of the first experimental, you know, rejuvenation techniques uh, and, and she becomes young again, basically, you know, a 70 year old woman who becomes 19 or something like that. And, uh, and therein amazing things happen. That's, that's where amazing things happen after that. And, it, and it's a really interesting story in part because he saw that a medical industrial complex, he hates liberty, by the way. He's not a libertarian. Bruce Sterling does not like libertarianism. Uh, he does not like the idea of liberty very much. But he also saw that the medical industrial complex was not likely to be a socialist egalitarian society or, or a utopia of any kind. It's highly stratified and it's kind of, kind of creepy. I certainly think so. Bruce Sterling, is it? Bruce Sterling. He was part of the um, cyberpunk, is that what they called it? Oh. Cyberpunk uh, movement? He was yeah, number two uh, man, yeah, number two man to, after yeah, William yeah. Gibson. Okay. I, I know the cyberpunks. They, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I met one of them at a conference uh, a few months, a couple months ago. Did you? I don't, it could have been him, but it, I, we'll see. I don't know. I'll check. I have his business card somewhere. I'll check it. Yeah, very good. I'll be curious. Anyway, so we're kind of at a weird, interesting moment in history where we are reacting to a crisis. Mm. Now the crisis, I mean, because the way we react to it, it seems like it's overblown. And so maybe I'm wrong and maybe I shouldn't be skeptical, but I'm, I wonder about all of it. And I don't really trust who <laughs> was at the world health organization or the CDC. The uh, CDC has made huge mistakes. Uh, so everybody tells me and they're blaming it on Trump somehow. I don't really see how he's responsible for the, for the errors of CDC, but he maybe he is. I don't know. I don't know. Mm. Mm. Um, it's interesting because I, I was okay. Let's say that the however many deaths they uh, project we could have in the, in the next couple of years. Or, um, let's say that all of them come to reality. Um, I I don't remember how many that was to be honest with you. Uh, but but I was interested and I went to the CDC and using the CDC's own numbers, I, I looked up the, the 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 numbers of the causes of death around the U.S. Um, and I don't have it in front of me, sadly, but uh, uh, I had it broke down, broken down, cause of death, boom, 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 boom. And at the top was something like uh, cardiovascular. That, apparently, that kills more than, than just about anything, uh, cardi cardiovascular related um, illnesses or what have you. Uh, then you had, I don't want to say tuberculosis anyway, but. but uh, you mean emphysema and related diseases of the lungs? Uh, I, yeah, I think, I think something related to lungs was, was way up there as well. And I also noticed, um, what was it? Oh, I also looked, just because people keep comparing it to the flu, I also saw some articles that says stop comparing COVID-19 to the flu. But, okay. um, but, but just because the flu does kill so many people every year, and just because governments don't think that the, the appropriate response is to shut down the economy, right, and, and social gatherings, I, I looked at, and to see what the CD said, the, the estimated numbers of deaths for, for flu. And, and they estimated 20, 20 some, just in this winter alone in the United States. So they, they, it was, um, what was it? I think sometime in October until, or, or no, sorry, I guess it would be December. So December until uh, even, maybe not exactly the winter months where it begins, what, December 21st or whatever. Uh, but December months, uh, let's say beginning of December or something until, what is it, the 7th of March or something. They said just for these dates, uh, they estimate in the United States alone the number the number of uh, deaths uh, where the flu was the cause uh, was something between like twenty four thousand to fifty something thousand. And can, can you imagine if fifty? I mean, if twenty something thousand people die of COVID, they're they're gonna. I mean, it it's it's much less than that now, and it could be much less than that. But the but the response relative to what they're doing with the flu is an enormous over response. So why, why I don't understand. I, I don't understand. The only thing I can realize that I can uh, fathom here is that uh, COVID-19 is new. It, it's novel. And as it is novel, it is scary to the population. And that is, as it is scary to the population, it, it, it's, I hate to say, it, I, I think there's some benevolence in the, in the, the reaction, but from, uh, politicians, but I, I, I don't, I don't assume mostly benevolence. I assume they, they mostly see this as it's politically profitable for them to, to respond to this, to COVID-19 much more than they do, let's say the flu. One doesn't want to come off uh, callous as they say, uh, mm. but I had a flu or a cold 
all winter long. And it's, I'm just over it basically. Just like last this week is the last week that I feel like I'm, I'm, out, I'm out of it. And it was different from every other flu and cold I've had in my life. And it came back twice or came, you know, it just came, it came, kept on coming back. And, and it robbed me of energy and it was a dry cough. And it started in December. And I'm thinking, what was that? And it was odd to me that when the coronavirus began to be talked about, is that they didn't talk about the other illnesses that were out there that could be mistaken for or not. And uh, they didn't recognize that there was something mysterious or different in, uh, in uh, effect. They weren't, te- they weren't saying it at all. Uh, they didn't reference it at all. And I polled the people on Facebook like last week or the week before and I had about five or six friends say that, yeah, we, we, we had the same thing. So all over the United States, or at least the West Coast of the United States, there was a cold flu thing that was odd. And then at the same time, we're being told that there's this odd new disease. With similar symptoms. Some similar sy- symptoms and overlap, yet they never talked about it. And I found that to be very, very peculiar. Like if they were serious about COVID-19, seems like they would be very careful about distinguishing it from other things and, and then also recognize that there's something different about this one because everybody, all my friends said, that, even a friend in England uh, said that, yeah, that's what I had. It's just odd. He was surprised that somebody on the other side of the world had the same stupid illness that he did. And, and so it's hard not to also think conspiracy theory at this point. And I'm, I don't <laughs> really want to go there, but, but, we know that there are people in the world that who want to do awful things. And it, in a country wherein they floated a notion to commit um, false flag operations on the United States citizens in the United States territory to start a war with Cuba. And that it was, it was nixed by the president or the, his, his uh, top banana. And it never happened. And it was supposed to have been buried. And we only by accident know about this plot. It's called Operation Northwoods. And we know it existed, and we know that the Joint Chiefs of Staff approved it. Sorry, uh, to uh, I I missed one detail. Uh, The the plot was to what? The plot was basically to uh, commit terrorist acts in the United States and basically blame them on Cuba so they could start Ah. a war with Cuba. And this was in the works. Operation Northwest, you can look it up, and it's a real thing. And we only learned of it by accident because it was supposed to have been buried completely, you just destroyed everything about it. And one of it was misfiled. And then during a FOIA request, somebody else got it out. So we know about Operation Northwoods. And we know that basically our Joint Chiefs of Staff to get the war they wanted were willing to attack American citizens and kill them. And then call it was by somebody else. So in that kind of a world, I don't think it's unreasonable for people to talk and speculate on conspiracy theories and the timing of this particular disaster. Um, mm. I mean, I don't know who would do it. I mean, almost anyone. There's a lot of suspects in the world. You know, for months, or, you know, for years now, I've been saying that, or a year at least, that, that Trump would probably be reelected unless there was an economic downturn. And so... Unless? Unless? Unless there was an economic downturn, and then he, the likelihood of his reelection would be low. All right. So, um, I don't usually do predictions. <laughs> okay. Um, uh, well, I don't know if I'll do one or not, but I'll, I'll just say what sort of, well, I'll give it, I'll certainly give a guess. So I, I know what you mean. Uh, I, I know I saw something from Trump a, a, some months back, uh, sort of applying pressure to the Fed to keep interest rates low because he wants to postpone, of course, uh, the correction that, sorry, it, it was coming before COVID. <laughs> yes, <laughs> <And> yes. <laughs> right, it's we, a thing we you must coming. not mean. This is, this, is, this is the one that will get all the blame because- most people don't follow economics and, and to the extent that they do, they, they don't understand business cycles, right? Yeah, this was, this was coming anyway, right? Here, here's why I think even during, during an economic downturn, he, he'll probably still get reelected and maybe even more so, uh, is, it, I think it makes his, my guess is it makes his reelection more likely, uh, is, is that's because it, it's a national emergency, uh, and and uh, in, incumbent presidents always do well during national emergencies, especially if they attack. If they can be seen as trying to attack it with full force, they can always say, "Ah, you don't want the you don't want the next guy 
uh, I'm the one that knows the problem. I'm the one that, that uh, started these programs. I'm the one that blah, 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 blah. In the same way that I remember when, when George W. Bush, during his first term after 9-11, when he was, go especially as, as the months coming up to um, the campaign for the second, uh, the second term campaign, uh, he was reminding everybody, I'm a wartime president. I am a wartime president. He, that, that, was his, that was his term all the time. So national emergencies, as long as the, the incumbent uh, can be seen to uh, responding appropriately in, um, in, in terms of uh, starting new government departments and throwing, it used to be many billions of dollars at it. And now with Trump, it's tr it has to be with a T now. Uh, if, if you throw any, any huge number of billions, uh, it's just not considered serious enough. In the, in the new age, everything has, has to have a T on it or it's not. It's just not taken seriously. Well, it's like Dr. And, Evil and his million dollars that he wants. Right? <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. And that is, of course, would implicate the Trumpian side, perhaps, is that they wanted to provide cover for the correction that I thought could very well come before Election Day. But, you know, the other side... And he can blame fight. it. Sorry, sorry. And he can blame it on COVID because for people that don't understand business cycles and don't understand quantitative easing and this kind of thing, uh, and some subprime mortgages and that, uh, you can just blame the whole thing on COVID. And I think enough people in the population, enough voters will go for that. Well, it's, it's not even, it's not implausible because they are wrecking the economy for this. So, I mean, yeah, <laughs> it's going to be very hard to sort out uh, what was caused, what part of the depression that's coming or whatever this is coming, but what is caused by uh, the, the reaction to COVID, uh, coronavirus, and what is caused by the dislocations of the policies since 2008. Mm. Yeah, there was a correction coming anyway. Yeah, I don't, I don't know what to say. It's just a very interesting thing that, because this changes a number of things. I don't know what it... And when somebody says we know where it came from, well, yeah, we have a good idea that it came from Wuhan, um, the city of Wuhan. Uh, the wet markets. Right, but also... But if you were... But if you were uh, a foreign power, let's say, or Dr. Evil, and you had the <laughs> coronavirus and you were working on it and you wanted to cause havoc. Well, what, what, where'd you put it? Where would you put it? Well, you put it where it has cover. You would, you yourself would release it in Wuhan. You could blame China and, uh, and it would leave, you'd have perfect cover. So just, just as the virus is a cover for the dislocation of bad economic policy, a good conspirator would use Wuhan as the place to put, put the thing. So I am um, hold all these things in a pocket. That is, I, I, I put them on a little shelf and I let them sit there and I'm not going to, I'm not going to say, I don't have, I don't believe anything. This is, this is what I think people says. So you believe in a conspiracy? No, I don't believe in conspiracy theories generally if they're not proven, but I suspect a number of things. And I don't think the suspicions are entirely crazy, but that doesn't change the fact that what, whatever coronavirus is, it is what it is, and we have to deal with it. And uh, I prefer dealing with it where people increase their own responsibility and so forth and take on the responsibility as much as they can themselves rather than slough it off to the government like pathetic serviles. Fair points. Um, generally speaking, I'll just... Uh, generally speaking, I, I steer far away from conspiracy theories, even if for no other reason is that, uh, um, well, you and I are both libertarians and we're often uh, accused of wearing tinfoil hats. <laughs> and, uh, and I did sort of get into conspiracy theories in the early 2000s. And I realized that some people were just kind of looked at me like, uh, just, uh, and, th and I was saying all sorts of things that were plausible, but couldn't be proved. And, uh, I've, I've, uh, I've since I, I run, I run from conspiracy theories. I, I think I'm better off because of that, but sure. It, it, is it plausible that let's say that the Chinese or, or a foreign, let's say you know, some false flag operation, some foreign government put, put this in a wet market in China plausible. Yeah. But my guess is it's unlikely. That's just my take though. You know, avoiding perception of even being conspiratorial because I, I like when I speak that people, uh, people don't just roll their eyes. <laughs> Here's the opposite of that. I've been a firm invisible hand guy since 1980. This is my favorite subject 
I've been, I, I love the evolutionary theory. I, uh, I'm very interested in Smithian and Mengerian economics. Uh, social theory of the evolutionary sort is my bag. It's, it's been yeah. what I've studied all my adult life. And I got rye rolls too. So the idea that we're, that by avoiding the talk of conspiracy, we're, uh, we're being, uh, we're avoiding some nasty and negative thoughts. Well, yeah, but you're also getting some. Because try, try explaining evolutionary theory or the invisible hand to a person who has almost no capability of thinking in terms of systems and complex ah. emergent systems. I mean, I have, I have been scorned many times because I thought that the, su the subject matter was best explained in terms of invisible hand processes. Ah, yeah, that, that's particularly interesting because uh, certainly uh, um, evolutionists uh, in academia, they're not, they're, they're not usually thought of as just um, being, uh, being conspirators. Uh, they're thought of as, as well, that science. But e even if you happen to be a religious person, I think most religious people don't see them as conspiring. I think they see them as just uh, uh, biased and incredibly mistaken and so on. Um, but it, it is interesting um, in terms, because you, you made the Smithian Darwinian connection, and that's one that I like to make very much. Uh, and, and you mentioned systems. Uh, and and it, it, I will say it's a little bit odd. This is maybe slightly off topic, but related. And I, I've said this a few times. I know, I know that Jonathan Haidt has made this point. I know that, um, Matt Ridley has made this point that it's a little bit odd that uh, intellectuals, many of them being atheists, who understand that there can be order within complexity in the natural world, uh, and they understand evolution uh, through natural selection, uh, suddenly when it comes to the economy, uh, they're, they're, they believe in intelligent design, and they don't understand how there can be order under complexity in the economic world. But there are, nevertheless, there are conspiracies, and, uh, and I don't... I no longer dismiss them. I, I dismissed them until about three years ago. Almost everyone. I didn't, it, I wasn't even interested in them. I was radically uninterested in them for the reasons we just gave. Uh, yeah. But then when I found out that there were a few conspiracies that really were big and were really important, for instance, how the CIA has controlled the media in America, that was a conspiracy. And there's a number of things like that that are conspiracy. There are hidden plans that are put into place by people who have agendas and that and and it, it's with the conscious design and those are conspiracies and our government engages in them uh, and it's not all ones that they didn't do i mean it's not operation northwards all the way operation mockingbird was a thing we've had many really gruesome and weird uh government activities in the last 70 years or 100 years or 150 years or forever and uh, I'd like to, I just fess up to them. But in this case, I mean, if this is a virus, that's not really, you know, the, the importance of a conspiracy theory is not very important. I mean, it's not. Uh, we still have to handle that kind of thing, however right. we handle that, and we should decide on the, the best way overall. And it is weird to get back to something we are talking about before I brought up the horrible C word. Um, it is weird that we focus on one bad thing and ignore all the other bad things and we freak out about the one bad thing but not the others it's like in the case of uh um we're desperately concerned with terrorism for instance but we're not really concerned with traffic fatalities which in america are far worse exactly uh, exactly no sense of proportion in these responses right and uh, nobody suggests that we don't drive right and it, but it seems to me the COVID-19 response, it mirrors uh, it, the equivalent would be something like um, in, in order to uh, minimize uh, traffic fatalities, no one's allowed to drive. But no, but everything, everything comes with trade-offs, right? People understand the trade-offs between, yes, I, I, I accept an increased risk by, by my freedom to be able to drive wherever I want, whenever I want. We accept the trade-offs and the higher risk because we want to be able to live something, uh, well, we want to be able to live in freedom, right? We want to live something that we call a, a really living, right? Which means, really living means accepting risk of death. <laughs> yes, it you know? does. And that's yeah. also something that kind of freaks me out about everybody else freaking out. Yeah. I mean, I mean to me, it's very important to be very careful about the people in the high risk categories. So I don't think we should be visiting old people. I mean, I, I hate that that's, you know, teach your mother or teach your grandfather how to use Skype or 
Zoom or like we're using now or FaceTime or something. Uh, we don't need to be there breathing on them. So during a time of high contagion. Oh, got it. We don't want to accidentally give our grandparents and so on. Right. To give, yeah, yeah, yeah. Some social distancing, especially with them. As tough as it is, because it's hard to say that because they might be the ones with, with uh, let's say, the, the need for the most em emotional connection with real flesh and blood human beings. Uh, but yeah, yeah, certainly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know. That's tough. That's really tough. We should consider yeah. ourselves lucky, though, because the Spanish flu, which was the last major plague on the, upon the planet, was right. a huge problem. That affected the healthier people. It wasn't the, the, the infirm and so forth. It was actually it, the disease commandeered and somehow jimmied up the uh, immune systems of healthy people and turned the immune systems upon the, the beings themselves, the, the, the bodies. And people died horrible deaths. It was just gruesome mm. beyond words. And, mm. uh, and so we are, in a sense, we're quite lucky with, it, with uh, the coronavirus. This is not anything like the horror of the, of the Spanish flu. Mm. Mm. Just, in, I, just I, even I, the matter of death. I mean, really, the, 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 that was a people bleeding out of their ears, and it, it was just awful. Really? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I, I, I've looked into it a little bit, especially, you know, COVID, because people keep referring back to that. Um, I know in terms of, there's a, um, let's see, I'm trying to figure out, uh, so if I want to go chronologically where the left is the past, and as we as I go to the right, there's the future, so I'm trying to yes. face the audience, not face, so, uh, um so I, I know, like in terms of numbers of human deaths in the world, of course, there was a, a big spike in World War I. Uh, and, and then there was a, another big spike right after World I. Uh, and if you, if you don't have the dates for World War I exactly correct, you'll think that that was just part of World War I. But no, no, that was, that was Spanish flu deaths. And then, of course, another spike uh, for World War II. Yeah, it's quite, quite, quite an amazing thing. And it turns out that the Spanish flu lingered uh, into the 50s. People were getting it, but they were, but it, it had evolved, I think, and the people had evolved. I'm not sure. This is not an area that I know anything about, really, though I have heard that. Um, so we have an interesting disease. We are still learning about it. A number of treatments have come out that are promising. There's one being used in Japan that seems to be that seems to have some good effect. And there is a proposed treatment that the uh, F the FDA just greenlighted that they'd been sitting on for years. It was a possible treatment. Uh, but because the FDA has an, an amazingly rigorous and uh, costly means of getting things approved, uh, this treatment involved a generic drug. And so there was no reason for anybody to do anything about it. Though the Center for Disease Control has known for decades that there's something going on here, that this kind of a disease, the coronaviruses, are, are out there and that they're a problem. And they had a possible solution, but they basically just sat on it. Mm. And it's, the problem is not just, it's not that they're evil. It's just that the FDA was in the way and no company wanted to really jump on it because there was no money in it. So this is a problem with the FDA. This is this is not a, this is not really saying it's a conspiracy at all. This is just a, this is just normal government kludge, right? That's yes, how yeah. that's how government works, not very well. Yeah, yeah. The uh, and Milton Friedman used to make this point, of course, that uh, um, the the regulators they get all the credit if they stop a bad disease, but they get uh, they get no blame if uh, if they screen uh, possible. Um, uh, medicines that could indeed uh, save millions of lives. But, you know, this is the problem we get in all social theory and, ec and economics in particular. Economists, I mean, we know that there is such a thing as opportunity cost. And what we're talking about there is an opportunity cost, is that the opportunity cost of an FDA, a long FDA procedure to get something into the market, the opportunity cost is the things that can't be, go to market because of the huge expenses, Right. And we know that opportunity costs are real, that they affect human life. Yeah. But they aren't but facts. They aren't. they aren't, you can't, you can't really fact, say factually there's an opportunity cost because they're counterfactuals. That's what we're talking about. So we get in a really interesting, weird area. And it's one of the reasons I've always leaned toward the Austrian school is the Austrian school has realized better than most economists that 
there is a philosophical dimension to human action that isn't just about the facts, ma'am, right? It's about, it's about a very robust conception of what life is, and choice is like. Agreed. Yeah, we preach to the choir a lot around here. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it would be better if I was a, uh, maybe if I was a, a Keynesian or something, neo-Keynesian, and, I, and, I, and we could have a debate, and then, yeah. yeah. Though uh, even Keynesians are better than, <laughs> are better than neoclassicals on the subject sometimes. Uh, there are post-Keynesians who have understand very well how weird, uh, how hard it is to track what's really going on in the economy. In terms of economics and the approach, uh, I like very much um, Peter Boatke at uh, George Mason University. Um, was his book, Living Economics. He explains quite nicely uh, that um, where the, let's say the neoclassicals tend to focus more on efficiency maximization. And in fact, if you, if you pick up a, a standard mainstream economics which tends to be neoclassical in the United States. You pick up a textbook and it talks about it in terms of uh, efficiency maximization. Um, I actually think, I, I don't think it shouldn't be that at all, but uh, in terms of focus, I no longer am under the view that it should be mostly about that. Um, uh, the way Pete Bodke explains it uh, is uh, it's, it's, uh, it's about exchange because if you just get in, in terms of efficiency maximization, if you just get caught up in that, you, you forget that, that people have things of value that other people want and they're both better off with uh, you know, the gains of trade, right? Uh, the understanding of uh, comparative advantage and so on. Um, and uh, in understanding sort of the, the spontaneous order uh, that comes about where people ve with very different interests are able to cooperate uh, somehow, uh, let's say in a Smithian sense, uh, in a, an invisible hand. Uh, I don't mean that, it, you know, I'm not, I'm not a believer, so I don't, I don't believe there's a puppeteer from above, you know, making things happen. But just in the same way that there is, uh, there is order within complexity in the natural world, um, there is within the economic world at all. And we libertarians tend to call this a spontaneous order. Which is right out of Hayek, which I think is right out of Adam Ferguson. I think that's where the, the, the uh, idea comes from, but I could be wrong. Yeah, um, it, it, I think it was Ad, Adam Ferguson said, um, uh, normally I'm able to just say it, uh, but um, uh, oh, I'm forgetting now, shame on me. But uh, it, was, it was Ferguson, certainly, I know, I know it's Hayek that quotes Ferguson, was, where he says, uh, uh, the product of human action, but not of human design. Right. Yeah. And part of that is simply, if you look, if you analyze how human action works and look at a cause and effect, effect matrix and then see the ends and mean matrix on top of it, you'll notice that the end you're seeking is only one of the effects that an action would, take, would have. So uh, you can't be in control of all those other things. So it gets to be a very interesting problem. It, it's an interesting thing to see how complex the world is and that it actually works at all. One of the things that... Uh, just normal life sometimes just astounds me that we're driving down the road, that we're getting every, all these things we want and we don't really have to think about very much. We can be blasé about the miracles of the civilization we live in. And most of the things that we want are certainly not things that we plan for, but we just grab them as they come into, into view. Mm, mm, mm. Uh, that's another very Austrian approach because we don't, we don't sort of take, um, not to say that all neoclassicals do, that's, that's not what I intend to say, but, um, but certainly um, we understand that um, the Austrians tend, tend to understand that the ends means uh, framework uh, and then rank, ranking, uh, ranking people's pref preferences ordinally, uh, knowing they can't be split. Like if I want a house, a half a house is no, no use to me. I want a whole house. And I imagine a world in which I live in a whole house right? It's not divisible into a half. You can divide into a half, but, but the half is no good to me. Right? There's no shelter in a half of a house. Split right. down the middle, cut, cut in the middle, right? And the Austrians tend to focus, of course, of course they tend to be radical subjectivists uh, and tend to uh, recognize that people's ends are changing all the time, right? They don't, right. They don't take it as fixed. Uh, you know, the um, behavioral economists will say, ah, oh, well, all right, so, so t tell me your, tell me your, uh, Tell me, tell me your list of preferences, and then if you if you do something that wasn't uh, wasn't ex exactly according to what they said uh, was in line with you achieving your stated ends, uh, if you say, "Well, I, I on the spot I changed my ends," 
and yeah. due to, you know, for whatever reason. And, and there were uh, certain means available to me to achieve those ends. And I changed my mind. This is how humans work. It doesn't necessarily make me irrational for doing that. Yeah, good point. It's, uh, and we can get back to this, actually, with, with, to the good old COVID-19. Um, there are some problems of uh, granular nature here uh, and double effects that are that we've just been talking about. And one of them is that uh, most of the people in Italy who are dying of coronavirus also have cofactors. They have, they have other illnesses. In fact, 99% or something like that was the, was the figure I just read yesterday in Italy who died of coronavirus had another major disease. So this is a disease that depends for its lethality on other diseases. Oh, that's interesting. No, I haven't looked into that so much, but I, I think I saw somewhere that having COVID leads to X. I don't want to say X and people sort of think that's true. So do your own research, people on the internet. But uh, uh, but yeah, so two things. One one is it could cause, the, the COVID could spawn something else and it was the something else that actually got you and you know, flu or whatever. And flus do kill people all the time. And then there's the other fact, just the other, that you could have two things at once. Uh, and, and as I mentioned at sort of the beginning of this conversation was, was uh, my guess is in terms of uh, uh, the reported mor mortalities, number of mortalities uh, COVID-19 caused uh, on the WHO's website, for example. Uh, it could be, uh, again, especially in the elderly who die of other things all the time. Right. Uh, if they find COVID-19 in their system, my guess is they're they're calling that a indeed it's it's a false positive not a false positive and and the person didn't have COVID nineteen necessarily but just a false positive in the sense that it wasn't caused by that although though it was in their system. Well, it's an interesting problem, and there's something we have in social science all the time, and which where I'm more familiar with it is that when you have a multi factor situation, any one of the factors it could be considered to be the cause of something, right? I mean, it's which yeah. which of the factors right. is the cause? Well. Right. What if they all work together and it wouldn't have happened without without the cofactors? And so it's it's a, it's, a, it's a it's a it's an interesting problem, and I think people should be a little more philosophical about it. And that's where I'm most concerned about getting people uh, infected with the disease. It's not for you that I really am worried. It's you know for my sister and brother-in-law on the hill, and it's for my my older relatives and that kind of thing. They're they're the ones that I'm most concerned. Though I'm more at risk than you are. I'm 60 years old, so that's that's. Uh, quite a risk factor right there and i've just been sick by a, with a strange disease all winter and that's that's something to be uh, somewhat alarmed about i don't know is that a good thing or a bad thing i don't know you know that's interesting you mentioned that because given that i'm not 40 yet and given that i sort certainly like to deal with problems if, if especially we libertarians if we can if we can uh fix a problem with more liberty rather than less then we we say well then our bias is towards more liberty and let's go with that right um, most of the time. And yeah. Um, so my, my first thought is, well, can, can we just get this in our systems as quickly as possible by not shutting down, you know, the, the global economy and, and all our social gatherings and so on. My, my first thought was, well, maybe actually I wouldn't mind having it. So I'll be immune, but someone, I haven't looked into this yet, but someone mentioned the other day, like apparently if you, be, if you get it and then you survive it and you become immune, you're immune for like a year, maybe two, you're not, you're not immune for life in the same way that you would a number of diseases. Yeah, I've, I've heard conflicting stories on that. I've heard that there's no immunity at all. The story really here is, is that we don't know, is that, or at least you and I don't know, certainly, but that I think that they're still learning a lot and we'll, we, we can expect better information as time goes on. I keep hearing that one reason for needing to flatten the curve in terms of, uh, let's say, fewer cases over time, uh, is, is that clinical trials, apparently, uh, reliable clinical trials for vaccines uh, generally take about a year and a half, right? 18 months-ish. Yeah, that's once you've started with the medications. First, you have to come up with the medications, which is an enormous amount of resources that it takes uh, in just finding that. Uh, some exciting news I saw, there was some interview with some senior level individual at IBM. Uh, was it, this was on Bloomberg, I saw this. Apparently, IBM is using AI. My guess is in conjunction with quantum computers, which they have now. They can do, a, you know, as you know, a, a lot of uh, calculations really, really fast. But certainly with, with AI. Um, and they, 
they um, just using some AI algorithms, they were able to narrow down. I forgot the, the total number of possible ways that you could approach possible drugs and, and let's say uh, combinations of drugs. Uh, they narrowed it down from, I want to say like, let's say 4,000 or something poss possibilities, which if they weren't using AI, they'd have to go and try them one by one until they stumble upon one that you want to begin an 18 month process of clinical trials with, but uh, using AI, they narrowed it down to, I think he said 44. I'm very good. Uh, certainly narrowing down the possible drugs that you want to begin with uh, for clinical trials is enormously helpful. And, and AI is helping with that. And IBM apparently is leading that front. Now, is this a uh, looking for a vaccine or is this looking for a cure or a palliative? I don't know, to be honest. There are a number of options here and, you know, anything that keeps people alive, I'm, you know, generally I'm for. Uh, so that's, that's a good thing. Um, I hope them, I wish them the best of luck. But once again, lots of people die of lots of different things and uh, giving up your freedom because we're freaked out about one disease, but not another does bug me. And yeah, uh, flu, you know, traffic accidents, you know. Yeah, yeah, and and I, I must say there is there is a reason why they're not as irrational as they seem. In this case, is the same reason it's not irrational to be more concerned about uh, terrorism than it is to be about bathtub deaths. Though bathtub deaths and terrorism may be the same number of people, terrorism is scalable up. Under certain situations, we can imagine terrorism scaling up to large numbers of of deaths. Whereas bathtub deaths are just not going to scale up. So the question is, what is the risk factor for getting more of the bad thing rather than less of the bad thing? And, mm. and that's an important point. And that's one of the reasons why, why they are concerned about a new disease. That is the reason. I mean, and that's not un completely unreasonable. And I don't want to come off like somebody who's just a grump. Uh, it's just that I think we should look at all these, all these factors and all these uh, comparisons and try to be rational rather than be demanding of a cure right now and blaming whoever you want to blame uh, because they did too much or didn't do enough. Uh, maybe we should let each other off the hook a little bit and maybe we should just talk to each other about how can we be better. That's what I think people in a free society would do is that stop blaming so much and maybe giving each other good advice and inquiring about better ways of doing things. Agreed. What do we miss so far? Assuming we only want to talk about COVID and just to minimize the length that maybe for this time. We have missed uh, metaphysics and the ontology of, uh, of the meaning of uh, generalizations. Go on. Uh -huh. I, will, I will notice uh, you, you mentioned a point. I think, I think you meant that you were sort of giving, even though you didn't say it this way, my guess is that's sort of what you meant. That, but what I think is probably an overreaction, maybe not, but uh, let's say the large scale response anyway on the, the part of politicians isn't completely irrational. I'm just saying the extreme concern is not an overreaction and being more concerned about this than the normal flu is not an overreaction. Agreed. Agreed. Now he, here's one thing I was looking at that I, that I thought, ah, I can see how they might be, uh, might be reacting extremely. Uh, in, in that I, I looked at the a court again, we're sort of, I'm sort of taking uh, the world health organization's numbers at face value. I noticed that the worldwide rate was, upward of 4% in I'm sorry, mortality rate of people who get co confirmed cases that end up dying, supposedly died from, from the COVID-19. Uh, it was upward of 4%, right? And so I can, so let's say just hypothetically that everyone on the planet got it. Of course, it's not, I don't know anybody saying that we will all have it, but people will say between 30 and 60% over the next couple of years or something. But if we use arithmetic alone and we assume that I think the World Bank uh, had the world population at 7.6 billion, if I'm not remembering incorrectly. But right, let's say that 7.6 billion people do get it, and let's say that the rate, uh, mortality rate, remains constant for for something percent. Uh, I, I think that was uh, 300 something million of us. <laughs> so, but but that's it, it, and I think a lot of people approach this with arithmetic alone, right? So it, on the face of it, it looks scary. And I can imagine if you're a politician and you only use arithmetic, you're, oh my goodness, right? But of course it assumes that people don't adjust their behavior, right? Right. That 300 million is about the size of the United States, but it's not everybody in the United States. I mean, it's, it's, it's going to be spread out over the world just as mortality is every day. 
everybody's that's dying right. all around us all the time. That's right. Ah, another thing. This was, uh, was it, um, uh, Johan Norberg who wrote, um, uh, was it, was it, um, well, a couple of nice books, including the work, the book progress and how things are getting better in almost every way that you can possibly mention in terms of income inequality, health, anything you can come up with just about, um, by every way that we can measure it, it's, it's getting enormously better. Uh, he's got a, on, I think it on the free to choose network. He's got a, uh, uh, he does videos, I think weekly now, just two bit sound bites. And usually, and he's, he's always, he always draws on data and, and he was summarizing, uh, on, on COVID-19, he, he was summarizing some work that had been previously done that, that said our immune systems are particularly are very robust. No, I'm sorry. They're, they're anti-fragile, which is better than robust. Robust means, so uh, robust means that it resistance to, to attack. Anti-fragile means gets better, the systems that actually get better because they're attacked, right? Right. Uh, and, and to the extent that our uh, immune systems are, uh, are anti-fragile is largely due to large-scale international travel. As people move around the world and give each other each other's disease, everybody else's immune systems are always adapting. With all this uh, disease spreading around the planet and we be, be becoming somehow the better off for it, uh, is that T.S. Eliot line, our only health is the disease. And uh, maybe it makes more sense to me now. I never really understood it. So on a T.S. Eliot note, maybe I should be uh, signing off. <laughs> It's been a pleasure talking to you. I think we've covered what we needed to cover, at least, or covered some interesting yeah. things. Is there yeah, something that I missed that I really should get from you? No, that, that's okay. That's great. That was great. Very good. Well, I have to thank again, Emil Feneff, for joining me for this conversation in this trying time of the quarantine over the coronavirus. Though I'm skeptical of many aspects of what politicians wish to do and seek to help us, I do think that we should take precautions ourselves, and I'm not in fact, at all skeptical about that. I think people don't normally take care of themselves properly with contagions. I think people are very careless, and I think our cultures are very careless and not respectful of others. So when we're sick, we shouldn't be running around and infecting other people. And if we have to run around, then we should protect ourselves. A handkerchief over your nose and your mouth, you know, in a bandana, as if you were robbing a bank. Well, you're doing the opposite of robbing. You are actually protecting others. In Liberty, this is the Locofoco Netcast. Timothy Vericola, thank you. <laughs>